Okay, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, also, thanks uh, to the sponsors uh, for the scholarship. Um, this is the joint work uh, of my advisor, Dan Halperin, and uh, Mika Bramson and Dr. Uh, Gav. So, the talk is more on the basic research uh, slash foundational side, but it relates well to uh, some of the previous talks, especially the first one. So, we know that in any uh, system or setting where we have multiple uh, mobile agents, the most basic requirement is safe collision free motion. This arises in various robotics applications and obviously autonomous uh, vehicles. So, in this type of problem, um, we're interested in uh, ensuring that uh, each agent, which is given a start position, so these are the start positions here, can reach its target, the given target position, so the circles here are the given uh, target positions, and we wish to do this in a collision free manner. This is a more standard way uh, of looking at these problems, and we further require in our setting that each, uh, each agent uh, follows a given path uh, as well. The path is on time, so you know it's not a trajectory, but it's just a path that it must uh, follow. And we ask the question, can the agents reach their targets using the given path? So the arrows here are the given paths. And this is the formal definition, so we look at the discrete uh, problem here where we have a graph, we given a set of agents, each agent has a directed path uh, in this graph. So here, for example, R0 starts in this vertex, this is its directed path, and this reaches its target. At each step, we move an agent to the next vertex on its path, provided that the vertex is not occupied by another agent. And I know here that this is a feasibility question. I'm actually not interested in optimizing anything. This might seem uh, a little bit too easy, but uh, as we'll shortly see, this is not the case. So let's look at the solution example just to make sure it's clear. So here we can have R0 first move, reach its target. R2 makes a move, it can stop, for example. R1 can then move, and then uh, R2 completes its motion. So the motivation here is, for example, robots following uh, some fixed path in factories. We saw this case of uh, the smart intersection where vehicles don't stop, so you can think of that as each vehicle having some fixed path. And indeed, uh, you can think of it also as being generalized to a whole city. Uh, smart transit systems, which today, for example, like airport shuttles that follow some given fixed topology along a fixed schedule, perhaps we want to complicate that and allow more complicated topology to uh, handle that, uh, or not fixed schedule and also handle that. So this is the motivation. And uh, we're aware of, of a work uh, with robots operating in the quarry where empirically solving this problem, where a variant of this problem was hard for already 10 robots. It was a bottleneck. So our question here is solving, what we're interested in, in solving this problem efficiently, and what are the barriers to that? Um, you can also think of it as if you're given a general problem uh, without the given paths, uh, you can use the version with the given, with the given path as a sub-procedure, right? Where we know that it's hard to jointly plan motion for uh, many agents, so you can first individually plan each agent's path, and then see if you can coordinate or schedule their motion along the given path. Uh, that's another motivation. Um, so what do we know about this problem? This seems like a very basic problem, a fundamental problem. It's actually relevant to models some other applications outside of uh, transportation and ocean planning. So it was studied by a community, a uh, discrete event system community, and uh, they have some uh, uh, results. So with some limited talk point skills, um, trying to show you what we already know. So if we go on the right here, we're looking at more restricted cases, meaning where we add assumptions and make the problem easier. On the left, we look at the general uh, version of the problem, which gets harder. And uh, just in case there's, uh, might not be, uh, not everybody here might be from computer science background, we like to, in computer science, given some problem that we want to solve efficiently, we like to classify it uh, in terms of its complexity. So we might say that a problem is easy or efficiently solvable. On the other hand, we can also say that it's empty hard which means that under standard assumptions, we do not expect to solve it efficiently, and we have to somehow come up with other methods in order to uh, cope with that. 
So what we do know is that the problem is uh, easily solvable for uh, very restricted cases where there's always a solution. And they're so restricted that it would take me too long to describe them. Um, they're very specific. On the other hand, it's empty hard for what we consider uh, instances that are generalized well beyond what you might see in uh, real life. So this is the gap that we uh, identify and uh, for, for more classical NP hard problems in computer science, we generally have a much better understanding where we can and, uh, know what is the border between hard and easy cases or some conditions that can make the problem easier, and for this problem, this is not known. So our contribution is giving a sharp tractability frontier where we characterize uh, when is the problem hard and when is it easy. I'll describe that in a moment. Uh, in general, the motivation for this is uh, guiding real solutions towards appropriate assumptions that might make the problem both applicable and also efficiently solvable. And in general, the more insight the results we get here, it gives us more tools to also solve the problem for general cases. Uh, we use those insights, we can use insights for more special cases. So uh, I'll just define some definitions uh, that will uh, need to present the results. So a key parameter we'll look at in this problem is vertex multiplicity. It's defined as the maximum number of paths that that might go to the same vertex. So in this example, in the uh, marked vertex, I would say VM for short, for vertex multiplicity. The VM is two, right? We have two paths going through it. In this example, we have VM uh, three. We'll also look at possible assumptions. This is a pretty standard assumption for this problem. We call it non-blocking targets. So an agent's target may not lie on another agent's path. This is what the assumption requires. So here we do not have this case because we have a target that's on this guy's path. And here we do not have this. You can think of it intuitively as you would not want to park a car in the middle of a road to block traffic. Another assumption is unidirectional motion, or you could also think of it intuitively as each lane has a direction. So in the graph, each edge is only traversed in one direction. So again, this happens here, it does not happen here, because the edges have to go like that on one edge. And just in case you're wondering why is this problem hard, why is it hard to find some solution? So if we don't have these assumptions, we're actually uh, if the result not having the assumption results in precedence constraints. Uh, constraints uh, that if we have a lot of them, it actually becomes hard to solve the problem. So for example, here the constraint is that R1 has to pass the R1, R0's target before R0 gets there. And similarly, this can also result in some constraints. So what are the results? Okay. Um, what do we know so far? So these are hardest results, right? That the problem is hard. Uh, so first of all, we'll show them that Problems are for general graphs, then two grids were considered also shown to be hard. And in both of these cases, we noted that vertex multiplicity was unbounded, meaning uh, in the hardest proof, uh, in instances built in the hardest proof, all the agents had to actually go to the same vertex. I will also just note the assumption here is that we don't have blocking targets. So, not, so this is sort of represents what we saw as unrealistic and existing results. We had a scenario like this, sort of the toy picture here. Uh, some other things that we saw, again, this is sound arguable, but the paths were not simple, meaning the agents would have to visit the same vertex many times, um, and opposite direction motion to the same edge also happened there. So what is our contribution? So we showed that the problem remains hard even if vertex multiplicity is three, already for this very low number. Uh, and that uh, this is tight, in the sense that for, for two, we can actually give an algorithm to solve the problem. So this is a sharp tractability frontier. If you look at, this is for general graphs, for 2D grids, it's hard for uh, four, so also a low number, a constant number. We also consider a different set of assumptions than previously considered, where we only have unidirectional motion on a 2D grid, where this is already hard for in the vertex multiplicities too, and for one, the problem is trivial, so this is again a sharp tractability for two. And just to note, this is a very distilled problem formulation, right? To show hardness when all the paths are just straight paths <coughs> on a 2D grid. It's a very restricted case that is still hard. Uh, we, there's some more stuff that we have in the paper I want to mention here. Um, so I just want to give you a taste of this is just a, hopefully a, a, a basic taste of, of 
our algorithm, we have predicts multiplicity of two. Uh, so we have a phase one of the algorithm. We want to move agents that have a clear path to their targets, meaning they can just go there without any other agent obstructing them, obstructing them. So R2 can do this. Then we have to check again if there's an agent that can move, so then we can move R1, then we move R0. So this is the first phase of the algorithm. Uh, the question is, okay, what are we left with after this phase? So some agent can go to reach its, reach its target because it's blocked by some other agent, which in turn is blocked by another agent. Uh, we continue with this and eventually goes a cycle. So we get this, a cycle like this at the end of phase one. Uh, and we also claim that the cycle is actually, this chain of agents actually ends with the agent that started the chain. So we cannot have the last agent's path go to some previous agent. Why is that? Well, if we just look at the vertex uh, multiplicity assumption, if we have what I described, we get a contradiction because now we get a vertex multiplicity of three. So we actually get this joint cycles under our assumption, and our goal is to solve the joint cycles that we can look at each cycle individually. So what does it solve us? Solving a cycle, a cycle is solved by moving each agent to the starting position, starting position of the agent that blocks it. So solving this cycle would be doing this. And now the cycle is solved. And we claim that after we solve it, all the agents can reach their targets. The proof is by contradiction, like in the last slide, using vertex model. Once we do this, we're done with the cycle. So I just need to describe to you how we solve the cycle. So we take the cycle, a given cycle, after we run phase one, we convert it to some equivalent graph, which is a slightly different representation where they could have edges, uh, edges uh, and each edge is labeled with the path of the agent that has to go to that edge. I think that's another paper. So what's the outline? For given such this special type of graph. So first of all, we check if it falls into one of two base cases. The first one is where there is just a simple cycle without any free vertices. And uh, to just clarify, when we look at this type of graph, we uh, can distinguish between two vertices. Right? Free ones don't have an agent with them, and other ones have an agent with them. So if you have a cycle with no free vertices, then we have an unsolvable instance. It does not have a solution. On the other hand, if every simple cycle graph contains two free vertices, such as the example here. We can give an algorithm that gives you the motions that will solve this cycle. So the which I will not go into detail here. The last thing that remains is what if we do not fall into one of these cases? So then we actually get a condition that every single cycle, or rather there is a simple cycle where with exactly one free vertex. We perform some untangling operation on that. So let's look at this. Um, so this is an example. This is a cycle, a simple cycle with one free vertex. It's easy to detect it by just following these edges. And we can untangle it, meaning we delete a vertex, get rid of the cycle, we get a graph that is equivalent, meaning if we can solve this graph, then we can solve this graph, if and only if the two. So we can continue like that. We find another cycle like this, we can untangle. Eventually, we must we prove that we must fall into one of the best case, base cases and give an answer of whether or not we can solve the instance. Uh, so just for a moment, that everything, can, everything here can be done in time linear in the sum of path lengths. So it's an efficient algorithm. Plus, as far as the algorithm goes, uh, just a couple of words on, on hard results. It's very technical, so I will not go into them. But we start by proving hardness for the case of two degrees to V and two. Uh, unidirectional motion and just straight paths. So this is, we start with this very distilled case. Uh, the uh, construction that abstracts some of the details away looks like this, and then we give the details of this construction and continue converting it to the other variants for which we put parties. So conclusion, so what did we learn here? So it was known that the problem is hard if we have uh, non-blocking targets, but we do not necessarily we do not have any direct motion. So we show that it's hard if we have another a different set of assumption, which is unidirectional motion, but we do have blocking targets. So essentially, each one of these, validating each one of these assumptions by its own, 
makes the problem harder. So a natural question that arises is, okay, well, let's have both the assumption. Let's have no blocking targets, redirection of motion. That intuitively makes the problem easier. And uh, this is currently open. And I should just say that it's open because we don't know how to deal with these cycles in this case. Uh, but if we don't worry about cycles, then it's actually not a hard problem. I mean, uh, assuming we can just rotate a cycle simultaneously, which you probably have never mind if you don't. Um, we also rule out another bottom line here is we rule out an algorithm uh, that is parameterized by the vertex multiplicity. <coughs> I'm assuming that probably people who are not necessarily familiar with this term, parameterized algorithm, but it's essentially an algorithm that whose running time depends not only on the input, but some parameter of the input, and it allows you to get a more efficient solution for an NP-hard problem. Uh, you assume that the parameter is small on instances of interest. And so here we show that even for a small vertex multiplicity, the problem is already hard, because we rule out such an algorithm. So we get an algorithm. Uh, for future work, we, we got a lot of intuition from doing this, so we could improve this to handle more interesting cases, um, and possibly uh, in apply its reasoning to some solvers for more general problems like multi-agent path planning or multi-robot motion planning. Um, essentially, scenarios like presented in the first talk, where we're also interested in other objectives than just getting everybody to their targets, but also getting them to their targets fast. Um, so, so the problem is essentially very uh, basic, uh, but at the same time, uh, I think our paper shows that even for these basic problems, there's still a lot we don't understand. And obviously, we want to be able to solve much more complex problems with big instances and a lot of things going on. And, um, and the hope is that this understanding will allow us to solve these problems better uh, and give us more intuition uh, towards these more complicated cases. And there, I have a few works. We have a few works along this theme, if you're interested. Uh, thank you very much for listening.